Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk a little bit about nuclear power. Generally speaking, nuclear power today is rather controversial, largely out of fear. While nuclear power plants can produce a significant amount of energy with less maintenance and general upkeep, both the fear of a nuclear disaster a la Chernobyl and the question of where to store the nuclear waste make the idea pretty contentious with support and opposition here in the United States sitting around 50-50. That's where nuclear power is today, but if we go back nearly a century to the 1950s, we have quite the different story. While today a major goal is to curtail nuclear proliferation, back then with the Cold War kicking off, it was all about getting nukes and making whatever you can nuclear powered. I mean, Ford and other car companies were making nuclear-powered concept cars. So it stands to reason, then, that the U.S. government's focus on nuclear power would extend past just bombs and power plants, going into aviation and maritime. We'll be focusing on the aviation part here today with the only U.S. aircraft that flew with an active nuclear reactor on it. This is the Convair NB-36H. Its story begins back on May 28, 1946, after the U.S. Army Air Force began the NEPA program, which stood for Nuclear Energy for the Propulsion of Aircraft. Two different engine concepts would be the main focus initially under this program, direct air cycle engines and indirect air cycle engines. Direct air cycle nuclear engines would largely mimic your standard jet engines, just being propelled by nuclear reactions rather than jet fuel. To describe it as simply as possible, air would be taken in and heated around the reactor's core, then expelled through a turbine and out of the exhaust. Because the design concept mimicked jet engines, this was viewed as the easier option as already available jet parts could be easily integrated. Indirect air cycle engines, on the other hand, were more complex but were generally viewed as being safer. As in direct engines the air went into the reactor core, this would increase the potential of radioactive pollution from the expelled air. In the indirect system, the air would be taken in and would still be heated by the reactor, just in an indirect manner. The reactor would heat some kind of substance, like liquid metal, and then that liquid would heat the air. This degree of separation would help reduce radioactive pollution, but the design was more complex than direct air cycle engines and would thus take longer to produce. And all the while these engine concepts were being built and tested, the U.S. military still had to make sure it was even feasible to have a nuclear reactor on a plane. Sure, it was physically possible to have one on the aircraft, but they needed to make sure it could be done safely. The reactor would be pumping out radiation that posed a serious health risk to the crew so they had to make sure they could properly shield against that radiation and protect them. Because of the in all likelihood large size of any initial nuclear aircraft engine, they would need a rather large plane to act as the test bed. In 1951, the U.S. Air Force would find an ideal aircraft for the job, and awarded the company Convair, a contract for the use of their B-36 Peacemaker design. Originally introduced back in 1948, the B-36 was an absolute mammoth of a bomber. Measuring in at 49.4 meters long and 70.1 meters wide, the B-36 is the largest combat aircraft ever made. There are larger aircraft in existence, to be sure, but they aren't combat aircraft. Powered by six Pratt & Whitney R4360 piston engines and four General Electric J47 turbojet engines, the B-36 had a max speed up around 430 miles an hour. More critically for the nuclear test, though, would be the bomb capacity and max takeoff weight. 
with a maximum bomb load between 72,000 and 86,000 pounds, there would certainly be enough room for the nuclear reactor. With an empty weight of around 166,000 pounds, and a maximum takeoff weight up around 410,000 pounds, this would give the military a great deal of wiggle room to modify the B-36, to add in the proper radiation shielding and make it safe. Still though, adding all the shielding would be a massive undertaking, having to make a new modified B-36 from scratch. As fate would have it though, a disaster down in Texas would turn out to be a blessing in disguise for Convair. In 1952, a tornado tore through Carswell Air Force Base, destroying or damaging a significant number of aircraft stationed there. One of the aircraft present at the base was a B-36, now severely damaged. As the plane would have to be overhauled, Convair would propose to the Air Force that they use this damaged frame as the test bed. After all, if they are going to rebuild the aircraft, they might as well fit it with radiation shielding in the process. The Air Force would accept this idea, and from 1952 to September 1955, construction on this modified B-36, now known either as the XB-36H or the NB-36H, would ensue. Visually speaking, the NB-36 didn't look much different than your typical B-36. The dimensions were exactly the same, and the engines were the same. The only visual difference was that there was a radiation warning symbol on the tail, and the designation XB-36H painted on the nose. The difference between the two was all internal, and the NB-36 was much, much heavier than the B-36. There were two major additions that would increase the base weight of the NB-36 by at least 50,000 pounds. For one, the lighter of the two was a massive 11-ton lead and rubber-lined cabin. When the original B-36 was damaged in the tornado, the nose in particular was damaged, so this made fitting the new cockpit section rather convenient and easy, all things considered. This large almond-looking pod would house the five crew members, the pilot, the co-pilot, the flight engineer, and two nuclear technicians. The other, heavier addition would be a 17-ton nuclear reactor. As the NB-36 was merely meant to test the radiation shielding, the reactor on board wouldn't actually power anything. The one megawatt reactor was active and operational, it just didn't power the plane. In fact, the reactor just sat in the bomb bay on a big winch system, which made it easy for the testers to move the reactor in and out. A few other less heavy modifications had to be made because of the radiation as well. The windows were replaced with 11-inch thick lead glass. Towards the rear of the aircraft, water tanks were installed in an effort to help capture any potential escaping radiation. Additionally, because all of the crew was confined to that 11-ton cockpit section, this made their normal minute-to-minute -minute maintenance on the aircraft much more difficult. On the B-36, the crew would typically monitor all 10 of its engines from the rear of the plane. However, the crew on the NB-36 physically could not be at the rear, so instead a television camera system was installed in the cockpit. Of course, considering the state of television technology at the time, this would be rather finicky, and it would likely present issues. Now, with all this added weight, the gross weight of the NB-36 shot up to 357,000 pounds. Still, this didn't actually reduce the maximum speed by any significant amount, dropping by just 10 miles an hour down to 420 miles an hour. It would take about three years to complete the NB-36, and in the summer of 1955, the NB-36 with an active nuclear reactor would take to the air. From that time to sometime in 1957, the NB-36 would undergo 47 separate test flights, 
for a total of 215 hours of flight time. The reactor would not be active for all 215 hours, but rather around a third of the time at 89 hours. The whole of these flight tests would lead to the conclusion that it was indeed possible to have an active reactor on an aircraft that wouldn't kill the crew. There was a noted risk of radioactive contamination if the plane crashed, but I assume that they knew this going in. After the flight tests concluded in 1957, the NB-36 would be dismantled shortly thereafter. From here, it was expected that the next stage would be the construction of a fully nuclear-powered bomber called the X-6. The X-6 was proposed as another modified B-36 with the added radiation shielding of the NB-36, added direct airflow nuclear engines, and a fully functional, active, connected nuclear reactor. How the aircraft would work with nuclear power is it would take off under some other power source, and it would run off of that until the reactor had properly spooled up. Once it did, the power would be switched over, and in theory, the plane would be able to fly without refueling for days, weeks, even months at a time. Then, when landing, the power would switch back over, giving the reactor enough time to wind down and cool back down. As a whole, the prospect of a nuclear-powered aircraft seemed kind of enticing, but not to the American public or its politicians. In all likelihood, the public wouldn't be so keen on what could end up being a nuclear crop duster flying over the United States, especially with those direct airflow engines. So the production of such a plane would be a rather hard sell to the public. More critically though, as projects like it could be kept hidden from the public, two presidents weren't very keen on the project either. President Eisenhower told Congress that he didn't think the project was really necessary, and he rejected a proposal to give the plan more funding and accelerate its progress. Still, though, he did fund the project at $150 million a year. Then, in 1961, President Kennedy would cancel the project altogether, citing the cost and duration of the project. $1 billion over 15 years. Additionally, with the successful testing of ICBMs in the United States in 1959, this made nuclear-powered aircraft less necessary. Instead of having a manned aircraft slowly flying all the way across the world to a target, they could just fire a missile. In the end, the prospect of a nuclear-powered plane in the United States was foiled less by the threat of nuclear contamination and disaster, and more by the fact that they were now making more convenient weaponry. Weapons that could more conveniently deliver nuclear warheads across the world. In a way, the failure of the NB-36 and nuclear-powered aircraft is indicative of how our weaponry has evolved to be more destructive and convenient. Modern militaries don't really need slow lumbering bombers to transport nuclear warheads. We have supersonic missiles that can do that. Viewed in this way, the failure of the NB-36 is kind of oddly terrifying. All right, and on that note, we'll go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. How many people watching have ever played the Fallout games? It's really interesting in the historical sense in that it represents a sort of dream future from the perspective of those living in the Atomic Age. Things like the NB-36 and the X-6 would be planes that exist in the Fallout universe, except everyone has them. Play the Fallout games, though. I think they're good. Really good retro-future post-apocalypse type game. Play New Vegas. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya!